chapter number 17. Uh, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. So uh, if you're looking for it, just look for Matthew. Amen. It is before Luke, I mean before Mark, after Zechariah. All right, Matthew chapter 17. Now, Matthew was one of the apostles or disciples of Jesus. Anybody remember what Matthew was in his life before he met Jesus? Anyone remember? He was a tax collector. A uh, tax collector was uh, one of these folk who actually was in cahoots, if you will, with the Roman government. They stole or cheated folk for their money, uh, often because they had the support of the uh, law enforcement agencies, if you will, of that time, the soldiers, and so so everyone had to pay taxes to the Caesars and the kings, and the tax collectors uh, would pretty much extort the people, say they had to pay taxes for $10, the tax collector would say, make them pay $13 and keep the $3 for themselves, and say, you know, don't tell on me or I'll put the Roman uh, soldiers on your back, you know, so the tax collectors were not considered friends of their own Jewish counterparts, because many, if not all, the tax collectors were Jewish, part of the Jewish uh, uh, or Israeli, Israelite nation, if you will. So, uh, Matthew was one of these such tax collectors, and he had one of those encounters with Jesus that he could not forget. And uh, Jesus called him, and Matthew actually ended up leaving that uh, 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 dishonest form of business and came to follow Jesus. Now, uh, his, his letter, the book of Matthew, is thought to have been written with the Jewish uh, uh, people in mind. They are, you know, always, just to give a little bit of more background, maybe give you some, some context, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew was written with the Jewish audience in mind. Mark, the first gospel written, was thought to have been written with, really with the immediate Roman Empire in mind. Luke was the last gospel of those synoptic gospels, gospels written, and it was thought to have been written with the Greek audience in mind. And John was uh, a gospel that was written with a unique kind of perspective, particularly for those who were trying to figure out is Jesus really God? All right? We had all these different kind of uh, views of Jesus' life uh, with eyewitness testimonies, and Matthew was attempting to make sure that everybody who heard his message would be able to say unequivocally that Jesus was the Messiah. That the Jewish folk looking for a Messiah would be able to read Matthew's writings and say, wow, he fulfilled this prophecy of the of the uh, Hebrew scriptures, he fulfilled this prophecy of the prophets, so he must be the Messiah. And in this way, then, we come now to Matthew chapter 17, uh, and we are engaging this text on what is called the last Sunday in our liturgical calendar, our lectionary calendar, uh, the kind of seasonal worship calendar of the church. This last Sunday before Lent is called the Epiphany Sunday. I love that because how many of you know that we all can use a few epiphanies in our lives? Oh, yeah. Everybody, everybody, everybody had like, I just had an epiphany, right? A light just came on. Just do that real quick. You know, lights. We need some lights to come on in our lives. So prayerfully, this passage will give a few of us some epiphanies uh, where we can uh, make some changes or, 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 or transitions or modifications. Uh, that will have our lives more in alignment with the ways of Jesus. Matthew chapter 17, verse number 1. You see uh, one of the verses up there on the screen. Uh, you can follow along there in your Bible or listen to me. But here's what the Word of God says. Six days later. What is the later he's talking about? Maybe I should give you that little context too. That's kind of funny to just say six days later. Like after what? If you read the chapter before, you see Jesus has just taken his disciples into a very foreign part of the country. It's called Caesarea Philippi. It was one of the most kind of quote unquote non-Jewish, non-religious parts of the Roman Empire. And in that experience, Jesus does a little bit of work there with his disciples. And after they have a great amount of 
uh, revelatory spirits, if you will. Jesus kind of takes a few of them with him six days later. This is where we pick up the text. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. I say, by themselves. By themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome with fear. But Jesus came and touched them. Oh, we ought to thank God for the touch. Amen. Amen. Saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So we will spend the next few moments speaking uh, from a very plain topic called highs and lows. Everybody say that. Highs and lows. Father, bless the word of God. Let us bring for us the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. Send your anointing. Let it rest upon me. You hear us of this word and anointing that is preaching, teaching, and even hearing easy. We'll give your name all the glory and praise. In your name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Highs and lows. Now. Uh, that is continuous. And that's really what rhythm really is. It is a continuous flow of activity. And in many ways, this flow is beyond your capacity or ability to control. But there is a rhythm that will happen in our lives that will not always be according to what we may want to happen. And the longer you live, I believe, you become more wise when you <coughs> are at peace with the rhythms of life. When you're young like me, praise God, or a young girl like some of you, or, or, or when you got a lot more money like some of you, amen, and, and, and a lot more power, or a lot more, more intellect, how many of you know you can kind of trick yourself into believing that you can force your will on the world, or at least on circumstances around you. That if you have enough money, or enough intellect, or enough power, or enough friends, or people, uh, you can kind of make the world after your own will. It's kind of what uh, the, 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 the way it goes. Uh, kind of like Frank Underwood in The House of Cards, praise God. Um, Many of y'all watch the House of Cards. Anybody watch the House of Cards? Right. And all y'all that are hung up on scandal, if you really want to see a good show, you should watch the House of Cards. Praise God. Yeah. Uh, back in rebellion in all its many ways. But yeah. you have a guy in there who, who, who seems to, amen, be filled with power and, and, and tries to manipulate events and, and outcomes. And because it's a show, it always seems to be in this way, but how many of you know your life is not a TV show? Yeah. Well, some of us live our lives that way. <laughs> Amen. But how many of you know there are certain events that will happen in all of our lives that are outside of our ability to control? Experience. 
somehow. And this is a very important part of what the rhythm of Christian life must be appreciative about because quiet as is kept, you cannot just follow the ways of Jesus on a continuous high. I know some of us want to believe that and, you know, want to every day, you know, act like that. You know, how are you? Bless you. How are you favored? Hello. You know, so, you meet people all the time. You know, it's like, you know, I'm, you know, you just float through the world unencumbered with no concerns or issues. But that's not what it means to be not only human, but a follower of Jesus. No. How many of you know, we met, met folk, and you ask them how you do this, and be like, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm just, <laughs> you know, like, man, I thought you was, that's the joy that lowers your strength. Yeah, it's, you know, from time to time, you know, sunny outside, he's like, but I see a silver cloud, it's coming. Uh, people just always living and existing in places that are low. Make no mistake about it, when we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was someone who experienced great highs. Amen. How many of y'all raising some folk from the dead? You can hide. Walking on water. It's got to know. It would be a great skill to use when you're on your crew. You just don't want to wait for the thing to take you back, right? You're just... <laughs> Bring it up. You take taking a little bit of bread and fish and feed everybody. Pretty good, huh? Amen. 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 I know some of you know what all is in here. It's like, hey, man, I ever need to know. Oh. I'm 
just here to teach everybody. Mm, I'm scared of you, praise God. But how many of you know that if God has kept me alive another day, maybe there's something God wants me to learn? Season of drought. Come on. Come on. 
And then all of a sudden you see the rain and say, hey, you ain't have to leave the guy. I'm like, hey, now I'm so into it. I'm gonna say man, right? Like I used to tell the man ran in, 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 in Vietnam, and they in a foxhole, and the bullets are whizzing by their head. There were no atheists in the foxhole. Come on. Come on. I can talk to them that there is a God. My like, God, help me. That's a general revelation. You don't need a whole lot of special, you know, epiphanies in order to have this general revelation of God. That God reveals God's self through nature, through science, and through history. That, that we can easily see that there is something greater than ourselves that is doing something that we cannot do. General revelation. But then theologically we talk about special revelation. And the special revelation theologically defined refers to the unique self revealing of God. in the history of Israel culminating in the coming of Christ recorded through the text of scripture that the church has preserved and we now embrace, interpret, and understand. Ooh, that's a long definition, right? Special revelation refers not to just a general revelation that God has made available for everyone, but special revelation refers to the particular revelation of God in Christ Jesus. This revelation in Christ teaches us that salvation is necessary. This revelation teaches us that through our participation in the church, which carries a particular history and revelation of Jesus, that we have access to a revelation of God that you could not just get by not engaging with Jesus. Come on, come on. In this special revelation, you find both the glory and the suffering present at the same time. The special revelation of Jesus. You find healing and pain present in the special revelation of Jesus. You see individuality and interdependence at work. In this special revelation, we see the paradox become resolved and the enigma become solved. The problem finds an answer, the hopeless find a hope, the powerless find power, the defeated find themselves overcoming, and best of all, in the special revelation of Jesus, the dead Transformed 
and change, not just you become a punching bag. Mm. And the highs and lows are like the right hook and the left hook. And you just take it up. When God wants you to actually be made better. Yes. As a result of your high and low. As we enter into Lent on this journey, you may need to ask yourself, how will these highs and lows put me more in touch with the journey that Christ had to make? Because understand, Jesus didn't just, you know, float through the world unencumbered. <laughs> he didn't just get baptized in the Jordan and come out the water floating. Slide up on the cross. <laughs> Slide down the cross. Slide into the tomb. Slide back up in heaven. Come on, Lord. Back in the Savior. How many of you know Jesus had to go through some
will not prevail. Ooh, now if you got some hell coming against you and you're losing, I want to submit. <laughs> Maybe you need to work on your confession. Yes. Maybe you need to think, man, who am I depending on while hell is on my table? If it was Obama saying it, you should be worried. But if Jesus says, you trusting in me will make sure that the gates of hell, the best that hell has to put up against you, your family, your relationships, your money, your body, your neighborhood, will not begin to prevail against that. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> but you can't get a revelation about your highs and lows if you just holding on to the people, places, and things. There's a significance of Jesus taking them high on the mountain. Because how many know not everybody wants to go to the mountain? Because mm. the mountain is hard. No, we just don't like take an escalator to the mountain. <laughs> Somebody say amen. How many of you see mountain climbers going up escalators just standing there? <laughs> no! If you go up a mountain, what you gotta do? Fine. You putting some risk in there. You may stuff your knee in, cut your elbow, bust your head. No? Come on, going up a mountain. Folk, uh, I'm not going up that mountain. <laughs> I like it right here. How many of you ever met folks who just love to be in the back? Sometimes revelation happens in the mountain. You and I gotta be people when Jesus is getting ready to go to the mountain. I'm going, I'm going. Tell my son. 
nature of Jesus was in full force. Stand back up. And then there were moments where Jesus is healing the sick. Go ahead. <laughs>
and your no is not what the real question is. The question is, God, how can I see you in my eyes? What are you trying to show me in my lows? How can I be in your presence in such a way that I don't get hung up on staying here because this is what Peter failed to realize. Why do we need to build a church or a tabernacle when we are the church? Everywhere we go, we are the church. So I can have church anywhere. I can meet God anywhere. It is not where I am. It's about who's with me. My prayer for us as we begin this journey. Lord, help me through my highs and lows to know and to see you. Give me an epiphany. Give me a revelation. Let it be undeniable. So you can get the glory. So you can get the honor. So even in my own maturation process, I can always be with you. Come on, stand with everyone. Let's take a few moments.